Good morning, everybody, and welcome to um, the public session of day two of the, uh, this part of the Citizens' Assembly here in Malahide. Today, we're going to focus on the family in our society. We will hear how the Irish family has evolved over the decades since our constitution was adopted in 1937. And we'll hear about the many recent changes agreed since then, including through referenda. We will hear the legal perspective um, about what the Constitution says about the family, marriage, and the role of women in the home. We will hear how that Constitution has been interpreted by the courts, how it protects the family, uh, also its strengths and weaknesses, given the more, much more diverse modern family uh, composition that we have in Ireland today. And as yesterday, and as I think we all found very powerful, we will also hear about the personal experience of individuals whose lives are affected by that constitutional definition and the laws and the policies that are shaped by it. But before we come to these issues, I just want to recall the work that was done by the previous, one of the previous assemblies, which was the Constitutional Convention, which actually met here in this same room almost exactly seven years ago in February 2013. Um, the convention was asked to look at how our constitution deals with, in particular, the lives of women from two particular perspectives. And the one that we're going to discuss today is um, contained in Article 41 of our constitution. And as we said a couple of times yesterday, it's often referred to as the woman in the home clause. The convention was asked whether that clause on the role of women in the home should be deleted. And a large majority of the convention members, 88%, favoured deletion. An even larger majority, 98%, recommended that the article should not only be deleted, but that it should be replaced uh, by a gender neutral text to include other carers in the home. And then 62% of that convention felt that the change should also include carers outside the home. And then finally, the convention recommended that the state should offer a reasonable level of support to ensure that carers shall not be obliged by economic necessity to engage in labor. Now, you've all received the text of the conclusions of the convention in this respect, and you also have in your packs um, the text of Article 41 of the Constitution. So those are the background documents for our discussion um, this morning. At the end of this morning's roundtable discussions, we're going to ask you to indicate on a survey form um, whether you agree with the conclusions that a previous assembly arrived at in 2013. And now, without further ado, I'd like to um, invite our opening speaker of the morning, Professor Linda Connolly from the Social Sciences Institute of NUI Maynooth, to set the scene for us by speaking to us about the evolution of the Irish family. Linda, we're delighted to welcome you to the, to the mic. Thank you. So uh, good morning, everyone. It's, it's very nice to be here, particularly on a Sunday morning speaking about family. I know we all have families, so um, I'm mindful of that. And um, I'm going to try and be as succinct as possible. Um, family is quite a complex topic, and uh, it might look simplistic at face level, but I suppose when we begin, like everything, to drill down into the sociological uh, trends in family life, we actually have quite a complicated picture. So um, I'm going to focus on the following issues quite quickly. Um, first of all, I suppose we're here today to talk about the constitutional definition of the family, but I'm going to talk about that for society. Um, secondly, really the main focus is how the family has changed over time. And as a social group, I think change is, I suppose, the most powerful metaphor in terms of looking at family life in the Irish context. Thirdly, I want to mention recognising family diversity, and in particular what we call the new types of family in society, um, what we might call blended families, cohabiting families, separated, reconstituted, one parent, and same-sex families as well. And then finally, I want to talk about the family and gender. And here I'm talking about um, not just the differences between sort of types or categories of families, but also differences within families as well. So um, the family has occupied, as we know, a core position in policy and public debate about the common good and national identity since the foundation 
of the state. The traditional family, for instance, was afforded, as we know from your documentation, a very special place in Article 41.1. And the state promises in that to protect the family and recognises, I suppose, the family, it's, 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 it's a lofty um, wording, uh, inalienable and imprescriptible rights, antecedent and superior to all positive law. Um, the family referred to in this clause, however, was, I suppose, what we might call the traditional form of family. And I think it's very important to be mindful when we use the term the family. I, I use it in inverted commas because we're looking at, I suppose, um, a category that is both subject constantly to change and is evolving. And the family we were talking about in 1937 is very different to the kinds of families we're talking about today. So the family was, of course, in that clause, restricted to one key type of family, and that was based on lifelong heterosexual marriage. Of course, we might, if I had time, I'd love to deconstruct in the 1930s, uh, but I don't. But it's important to remember that that clause in itself perhaps didn't reflect all the other kinds of realities of the 1930s, the fragmentation of migration, emigration, poverty, a lack of tolerance towards illegitimacy, etc. We also know, and I'll come to this at the end, that in the 1930s, Ireland had a very distinct characteristic. It had a very large number of single people, about a quarter of the female population and a third of the male population were what we might call in those days permanently celibate or never married. And that's a very interesting aspect of family life in Ireland. So it's important not to romanticise the traditional family and to look at family as it is um, and was. Um, I'm not going to speak too much about the, um, that the women were accorded a very specific familial role in the constitution. Siobhan is going to talk about that. But again, that clause was of its time and it reflected a very particular, what we call sexual division of labour in society, but also, as I said, within um, the family. Um, it's interesting, the clause in relation to women, I suppose, uh, referred to women's life in the home as opposed to their work in the home. And that's just one point um, I would say in relation to that. So the, what was the traditional Irish family? Well, it was protected, as I said, in the constitution, but um, it was a particular form that was protected. It was larger than the families we have today. So uh, women were having more children, um, but it was also extended, what we call the extended family. It wasn't unusual to um, live in the same household with your grandparents, uh, for instance, or in close proximity. And as I said, it was based on lifelong heterosexual marriage. So the main brief I have today is to provide some information on the nature and form of Irish families now and how... Um, the family has changed over time. And I just, want to say, I, want, I just want to say that I want to do this with clear sensitivity to the differences between families and the different types of families in Ireland. And indeed, as I said, the differences within them, primarily based on gender and also generations um, as well. So Irish society was considered, like many things, um, to be the outlier, the demographic outlier, for much of the 20th century in particular. And to have, I suppose, preserved the traditional family uh, for many more decades than other societies in Europe. In particular, uh, Irish society is considered to have embraced what we might call the more secular uh, European-wide values in personal and intimate life much later uh, than other countries. Divorce, for instance, was not legalized and until it was narrowly passed by referendum in 1995. At the same time, um, Ireland may have um, sort of modernised late in the sphere of intimacy and relationships, but when modernisation did take place, it was rapid. So if you can imagine a, a kind of a perspective of social change, um, late uh, but fast um, is a good way of describing it. And how might that be manifest, I suppose, is what we need to look at. So, for instance, um, 
you know, if we look um, at the question of marriage, first of all, and I'm going to put this in the wider context of Europe, because it's very important in considering family life in Ireland that we just don't look into ourselves all the time, that we look at what's happening um, in other countries as well, and that we can comp compare and, and make um, good policy decisions as a result. So the middle decades of the 20th century, around the 1950s, have been described as, I suppose, of what some might call the golden age of marriage. We're familiar with the kind of black and white uh, movies with the, the mom at home with the apron on and the dad coming in from work and so forth. And um, really, that was, a, if you like, more people were married than at any point in history. And they were marrying at a younger age. Um, but this, I suppose, idea of family has been fundamentally challenged by what we call um, the proliferation of more diverse expressions of family and personal life. And what some might call the weakening of marriage as what, what, what you could call the primary route into family formation. So if you look at that definition in 1937 again, how one entered into the family based on the two-parent model was through marriage. There wasn't really, if you like, another route. So today, there are different routes into family formation. Now, one of the key features of the Western family, and we can see it here, um, if you look um, at the top, the top of the graph, you have the marriage rate, and then at the bottom, you have the divorce rate. And you can see the divorce rate is steeply rising, particularly from um, the 1960s on, as the marriage rate is declining at the top. So you can see that kind of, if you like, uh, convergence effect uh, that we're talking about. So official statistics show that increasing numbers of children in the West now, for instance, adapt to and live with step-parents who may have previous children of their own. Um, and also, I suppose, that what's called post-divorce childhood has been coined as an ex uh, intrinsic feature of 21st se uh, century families. So that idea of children living in the same, if you like, familiar situation throughout, if you like, their life course has been challenged by these kinds of trends. Likewise, recent decades have witnessed, for example, a greater acceptance of gay partnerships and same-sex uh, families, for instance. And this is evident in Ireland since uh, the early 90s when uh, homosexuality was decriminalized first, and then, of course, uh, by 2015, um, when we got to the, the referendum on marriage. So the way I would phrase it is uh, heterosexual marriage and biological reproduction uh, no longer have a monopoly on family formation. And increasing numbers of children are also born outside of marriage or live with what we might call non-biological step-parents or indeed um, non-biological parents more generally. In some Northern European societies, we also see that cohabitation is an established alternative to marriage and more children are actually born inside than outside marriage. In France, for instance, 60% of children are born outside um, of the institution um, of marriage. So the Irish context then, I suppose, how do we compare, so to speak, in Ireland? Well, again, as I said, there is evidence of convergence in some indicators, but in others not. And divorce is actually one of them. The divorce rate in Ireland was, um, in fact, the lowest in Europe, in, uh, we have a 2014 graph here, but also in subsequent years. And um, it showed, what we're showing really in, in statistics is that there's less than one divorce for every thousand people, um, 0.7 in every thousand to be exact. Uh, the only countries that compare are Malta and uh, Montenegro. Um, and this compares, for instance, with the UK, where the figure is closer to one in every three marriages ends in divorce. So if you could imagine in this room, if we were all to get married in the morning, um, a third of us uh, in the UK would, would eventually get divorced. So that's a very high, if you like, divorce rate. But it's not the case um, in Ireland. So, um, so I suppose... Um, I think, though, that post the divorce referendum of last year, it will be important in the future, if you like, to look at the statistics, because we have had quite a restricted um, divorce uh, 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 law in Ireland where you had to be separated for five years. But even at that, it is still quite um, a low uh, rate of divorce. 
Um, you, can see it, you can see it there on the graph where Ireland is, the, the green line at the bottom is the divorce rate. Um, and then uh, other countries, Spain, you can see has a significantly, uh, the, 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 the line at the top has a significantly uh, higher divorce rate than Ireland. So again, you can't say it's particularly a Catholic, um, perhaps, um, thing that you know, other countries like Spain and Italy, etc., uh, have, have much higher rates. In other areas, um, such as um, um, non-marital births and um, the crude marriage rate, however, the figures in Ireland are closer to what we call European averages or uh, European norms. But again, I would put it in context because the marriage rate is very similar to the rest of Europe, but actually Ireland traditionally had lower marriage rates than other European countries for the reasons I outlined earlier. There was, if you like, a reluctance um, to marry um, throughout um, many decades of the 20th century, right up until the 1970s. So, um, so, so, uh, okay. So just to move on then, I suppose, very quickly to, so we've looked at um, divorces, marriages, um, and I just want to mention now births, and of course fertility, uh, what we call fertility or births, uh, is a very important part of family life. Because I suppose things like the average size of family um, are a very important indicator of how to formulate social policies. So I talked about the traditional family being the larger uh, family types, and um, the average size of family in 1970 was four. Um, today it's two, between one and two uh, children per woman um, are born. So families are shrinking in terms of the number of children uh, being born. And um, so the general overall fertility rate in Europe has in fact steeply declined in recent decades, resulting in what we call an aging population, which again, we're all part of this, we're aging, we're aging personally, but society um, is aging as well, we can't stop that. Um, so this is very important, I suppose, um, social policy issue as well. And in some countries, uh, what we call the replacement rate, when you average up the number of, you know, for every uh, average number of people who die in a given year, you expect a number of babies to be born to replace the population. But that's falling to very low levels in some countries. So how is Ireland comparing, I suppose, is one of the issues we need to look at. And if there is this steep decline in birth rates, why is that happening? And what is society doing to either um, support uh, uh, you know, families to have children um, or not, as the case may be? So uh, childlessness, for instance, is now a phenomenon. Um, and one-person households also feature increasingly in European data, including in our own. So a search for new ideas and perspectives on 21st century families has accordingly emerged in European debate. Now, again, should we be worried in Ireland, um, is the question, um, how, how, to what extent are we ageing in comparison to this broader trend? Well, the fertility rate in Ireland actually remains one of the highest um, in the EU. But again, be careful, because by historical standards, it's actually quite low. As I said, four children in 1970, uh, in or around two today. And it's very interesting, because Irish mothers are also one of the oldest in Europe. Um, uh, so on average, uh, Irish mothers are having um, children at the age of 33. And that's very interesting, because it suggests that, again, while um, women in Ireland are having slightly more children than their European counterparts, they're having them later. And there seems to be a kind of postponing um, effect at work there also, which we need to tease out. So, um, so there were, I suppose, more than 61,000 babies born in 2018. And um, as I said, uh, the average age of mothers was 33. Um, and we can see a very small number uh, uh, were born to what were called, I suppose, teenagers, to use that term in this, the census data. Um, 22 of them were under 16. Um, in, um, I suppose what's very interesting then, I suppose, is, is how, in what circumstances children are being born, what kinds of families are they being born into. And what we call um, the, the non-marital birth rate is the term that's often used, but um, births registers as outside marriage 
um, or in civil partnership, um, accounting for 38% of all births in 2019. Now, that's a huge turnaround uh, in a number of decades. Nearly 40% of all children born today are born outside um, of the institution of marriage. There's a very strong rural-urban um, difference. In the cities, um, Limerick City, for instance, 53.9% uh, of all children are born outside of marriage. So that's over half. Um, uh, and again, um, it's, uh, it, it, it varies. As I said, the overall average is 38%. In the EU, how do we compare? Well, actually, we have one of the higher non-marital birth rates in Europe. So we might say, in other senses, Ireland remains, you know, um, averaging. But in this area, um, Ireland has, is, is, is among the higher uh, non-marital birth rates in Europe. Uh, for instance, as I said, the figure in France is 60%, which would be the top range. But then in other countries, you have much lower uh, rates. I'm thinking of Greece um, and countries like that. So Ireland uh, is up there, so to speak. Um, okay. I just want to, in the last part, um, very quickly, talk about mothers and fathers and care. And I suppose, um, the, I suppose mothers are having less children, as we've seen, and smaller families than their own mothers did. But on average, I suppose we might conclude are, are more positive towards childbearing um, than other Europeans. They're also more likely to work um, outside the home, uh, and inside, of course, but outside the home as well, uh, than their own mothers uh, did. And they're older at birth, uh, at the uh, birth of their first child, uh, than many other of their European counterparts. So again, that's um, uh, important to, uh, to consider. Um, I would also say that it's very important to consider, in looking at all this data, uh, difference. The different position of mothers in Ireland is, of course, very influenced by a range of social and economic factors, such as socioeconomic status and social class, family status, whether mothers are married, unmarried, uh, lone parenting, cohabiting, um, etc. All very much frame the difference in the position of mothers in Ireland. Um, sexuality is very important as well, as, we, as we've seen in the recent referenda, etc. And I know some of those issues are being discussed um, this afternoon. And then finally, housing is one we often forget. 4,000 children in Ireland uh, homeless. Um, so these are huge issues. And I think there's scope within the family to, if you like, um, you know, look at the terms of reference of the assembly and how family kind of stretches or extends into some of um, these areas as well. Um, of course, um, also care. Um, you saw this yesterday with the census data. I don't need to repeat it. 98% of those looking after home or family were women. And although the number of men has doubled in the last 10 years, it's still a tiny, tiny uh, percentage. So we have huge gendered issues, issues around gender equality to look at in relation to the way in which the family is structured. We can look at the broad trends in relation to Europe, but we must also drill down into the categories, mothers in Ireland, um, children in Ireland, uh, etc. 91% of lone parents were women in 2016, according to the census. And again, this isn't just you know, slight variations in the data. These are overwhelming um, figures that are very important to consider. Um, you look at, for example, the one uh, parent family payment, 98% um, of recipients are women. If we uh, compare, I don't have time, um, the position of lone parents who are men and women, some very interesting differences there. More of the men in that category are widowed. Um, and also they're much older uh, on average than lone parents uh, who are women in society. Fathers, very interesting topic as well. Um, just to say, again, uh, uh, to use that metaphor of difference applied to mothers, we can also apply that to, to fathers. Um, I, I picked just one figure out there that a quarter of the children born uh, in 2014, for instance, were born, born to non-Irish fathers. And again, if we're looking at how difference intersects with all these categories, um, I suppose ethnicity, race, um, and also uh, residential status uh, comes into this 
as well. Okay, I'm getting the red light. I better move on to the end. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is what's distracting my eye here. Okay, so I suppose to sum up, well, there's an awful lot to consider in relation to uh, family life in Ireland. I've merely given you um, the highlights, so to speak, um, today. Um, I suppose just to say, um, it's very important, I think, I'm just sorry, I've lost my notes. It's very important to get a sense of um, the statistical changes outlined here today. Um, but we can no longer deal with a single entity called the family, okay? Um, and yet, the findings suggest that the, the key type of family, so to speak, statistically, is still the family based on marriage um, in Ireland. So what you're dealing is, I suppose, um, continuity in terms of traditional fam family life alongside very rapid um, change. And that kind of balance, I think, between you know, understanding, I suppose, the way in which families are resilient, uh, but also subject um, to change uh, is very important. Taking together the new forms of family and intimate life that are now evident in Ireland fundamentally challenge the notion that there's only one way to be married, intimate, and committed to another person in the Irish context. At the same time, most people in Ireland are still bound to family in some way or other. Um, the family is still considered the centre of intimate, personal relations through which as people we create and sustain meaning on a daily basis in our lives. But as I said, there is in reality a variety of types that were simply not evident or as prevalent uh, in 1937. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Connolly. That was fascinating, and I know you have a lot more data um, that we would have enjoyed listening to. So, um, and your presentation is put up on the web and it will be available to um, not only the citizens in the room, but also to everybody. There's a wealth more information there that you'll have the time to look at afterwards, and it, it is fascinating. Um, now, um, we're going to move on to hearing from Professor Siobhan Mullally, Director of the Irish Centre for Human Rights in the National University of Ireland, Galway. And as I said, she's going to speak to us about the family and the constitution and the law. So, Professor Mullally, I'd like to welcome you now to, to the podium. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for the opportunity to participate here today uh, in this discussion on gender equality and uh, specifically this morning on the constitution and the law in relation to the family. Um, the questions that have been posed to you for discussion and that I'm going to centre on um, really look at what our constitutional provisions are on the family and how those have impacted on how we regulate and support uh, different kinds of family units um, in Ireland. Uh, the, the family itself is protected in the Constitution, and you've all been given uh, the text of Article 41, which is this key uh, provision on the family unit. It describes the family as the natural, primary, and fundamental unit group of society, uh, and then goes on to talk about the family as a moral institution with inalienable and imprescriptible rights. Um, now, that's quite significant because just looking at the language there, you see that there's this idea of the family unit itself as being antecedent, as being superior to all positive law. So it has this kind of enshrined position within the Constitution. And for many decades, that language and that idea of the family unit is kind of sealed, as protected, um, as having a certain priority within uh, society and within law there was concern that that inhibited, that it hindered how we protected those within the family unit. Uh, children, for example, who might be at risk of exploitation or abuse or neglect, um, situations of domestic violence within the family unit. Um, could the state intervene? Were there restrictions? What were those? Um, that Was this somehow challenging or undermining this position of the family unit? And it took quite some time to get to the situation uh, where we began to recognize that the family is made up of many different units. 
uh, including children who may be at serious risk and that the state has an obligation to ensure protection, to ensure uh, equal treatment, to ensure that children within family units or others within family units are, are also provided with protection. Now, the, this idea of protecting the family uh, as a fundamental unit is not unique to Ireland or Irish, the Irish Constitution. Indeed, if we look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, adopted in 1948 in the aftermath of World War II, um, we see also this reference to the idea of the family uh, as a fundamental group unit in society, entitled to protection by society and the state. Uh, so it is something we see in many parts of the world in many legal documents. Um, but it leaves open the question of what kind of family, which families are given protection, how is the family to be defined? What are, what are the limits? What are the priorities? What do we mean when we talk about the family, um, whether in the constitution or in legislation or policy measures? Uh, and I guess one of the questions that you'll be reflecting on this morning is how much of this should be in the constitution and how much should we leave to legislation and policy? So, of course, there are many different types of families, and Linda has already raised the questions around the changing nature of family units in Irish society uh, and questions around who comes within the ambit of the family. What about joined or extended families? What about grandparents, um, cousins? What about dependent others, maybe uh, nephews, nieces, uh, others who end up in a situation of dependency that we might care for? Um, how many, what kind, how many of those fit into the family unit that is protected by the constitution um, or in legislation? Uh, and we know that Ireland has become a much more diverse society. Um, we now recognize and protect different kinds of sexualities and different kinds of relationships. And we're also more diverse in terms of increasing inward migration uh, over the last two decades, which again is a significant change in Irish society. Now, in the Constitution itself, um, the family is not defined. But what we do have uh, in Article 41.3, um, is this specific reference to marriage. Um, so the state has committed itself to guarding with special care the institution of marriage, upon which the family is founded. Uh, so this is provided for in the Constitution and the state is given this obligation to protect the institution of marriage against attack. So it's very significant, very strong language here. Um, it's quite defensive in terms of what it's talking about that the state must do in terms of protecting this institution. And that has given rise to much discussion, to case law, to litigation, to questions around policy, um, when can you intervene in the family? When can you not? What kinds of families are protected? And one of the landmark cases, um, quite a sad case going back to the 1960s, Niccolo and Bord Octola. Um, Niccolo was a Cypriot national in London. Um, he uh, had a relationship with Ms. Donnelly, who uh, was a young woman from Galway who traveled to London, uh, was working in his cafe and uh, she became pregnant. Uh, she decided to give her child up for adoption and to return to Ireland and was in a mother and baby home. Um, he didn't know initially about the pregnancy and only found out later uh, when she returned to England, when they did briefly resume their relationship, um, that she was giving the child up for adoption. And this was without his consent. So he took legal proceedings to try to stop this, to prevent the adoption going ahead without his consent. He wanted um, to be given the position of a guardian of care, to be recognized as the father of the child, and to not have his child going through for adoption. And the proceedings went all the way to the Supreme Court, um, and the court there was quite clear um, that as an unmarried father, um, he didn't have constitutional protection. Those rights uh, that he was claiming couldn't prevent the adoption going ahead without his consent. And the court made a number of important statements um, that are still relevant today. Although we've had much constitutional change, much legislative change, um, these statements remain uh, relevant. That the family that was protected in the constitution is the family founded on marriage. 
um, and to give equal protection to an extramarital union, to a relationship that wasn't based on marriage, would not be giving effect to the pledge uh, that is imposed on the state to guard with special care the institution of marriage. So you see the impact of that language um, on, these, on these proceedings and on his position as an unmarried father. Um, now, since then, there has, there has been significant change. We had litigation to the European Court of Human Rights, um, where the European Court of Human Rights said that not protecting an unmarried father's um, right to family life uh, was in violation of the European Convention on Human Rights. We've had legislation abolishing what was known as the status of legitimacy, the discrimination against children um, born outside of marriage. And of course, we've had a referendum protecting the rights of the child, the best interests of the child, um, and on marriage equality. So we have had significant change since then, but the Nicolau judgment remains relevant today, and I'll come back to that. So looking at some of those changes, um, marriage equality already mentioned, uh, the constitution changed by referendum um, to allow for recognition of same-sex marriage. Uh, marriage may be contracted in accordance with the law by two persons without distinction as to their sex. So that's a, a hugely significant change and it was also hugely significant that it came about um, by referendum, um, demonstrating the the popular uh, will in favour of this change and recognition of different kinds of relationships. But it's still based on marriage. Um, so again, that's the important point to note. And to give effect um, to the referendum and to the vote, <clears throat> we have had the Child and Family Relationships Act adopted in 2015, a very significant, huge piece of legislation um, look, making all kinds of changes with regard to family relationships. It's still not fully uh, enacted into law, so not all parts of this legislation, although it was adopted in 2015, it, it's been in, in implemented progressively and incrementally over time. Uh, so again, that raises the question of um, how useful legislation is in terms of uh, giving effect, responding to changing societies and relationships and using legislation rather than the constitution uh, to regulate uh, and define families and different kinds of relationships. Um, so the Child and Family Relationships Act uh, includes, gives effect to the reforms uh, from the constitutional referendum itself and makes significant changes in particular around guardianship and custody uh, of children. Um, and also, again, the specific commitment to recognising the child's best interests uh, in custody and guardianship proceedings. So that's all being implemented uh, over time. Uh, the most recent orders that were just um, signed uh, were in November 2019, and those won't come into effect until May uh, 2020. Uh, and those more recent uh, additional orders starting these pieces of the legislation relate primarily to donor-assisted human reproduction, uh, and again, to regulation of the relationships and the family units, um, the rights of the child, the child's right to uh, know their identity. So all of those kinds of relationships are now being regulated um, through legislation. There is still, however, gaps um, that remain to, to be fixed in terms of our legal frameworks, um, <clears throat> and a very significant case uh, is the McD versus L and M. Uh, and this is a case that went uh, all the way to the Supreme Court and it raised uh, the question of um, surrogacy arrangements, the position of a sperm donor, um, and uh, the, the relationship rights that come from this kind of situation. And here in the, the uh, relationship arose, um, a man who had been friendly with a lesbian couple uh, agreed to assist them in conceiving a child, donated sperm, and originally the discussion had been that he wouldn't be directly involved uh, in the upbringing of the child, um, but that changed after the child was born, and also their friendship um, broke down. Um, the couple uh, had decided to move to leave the country, and he brought legal proceedings to prevent that, and also to try to claim uh, guardianship and access to the child that was born. And 
In the High Court um, discussion, there was a significant discussion around the European Convention on Human Rights and the idea of a de facto family and recognizing and protecting private and family life and also best interests of the child. Um, the Supreme Court, however, took a different view and decided that the best interests of the child meant that there should be access given uh, to the child uh, on the part of the, the father who was the sperm donor and that the High Court should work out the details of this. But this was, in their view, in the best interests of the child. Um, they also said that the European Convention on Human Rights is subservient to the Constitution. But importantly, in terms of our constitutional position, uh, the court was quite clear that there was no legal institution in Irish law of a de facto family. This was simply not something um, that was recognised uh, in Irish law in the constitution itself. Um, so this idea of trying to recognise different kinds of de facto families or units um, they said was not something that was recognized in the Constitution. So again, that leaves a lot unclear here. Um, we, we can look to the best interests of the child. We can look to other parts of the Constitution on personal rights, on the rights of the child, Article 42, which was inserted following referendum, Article 42A. Um, but the, the Article 41, which specifically re relates to the family, remains tied to this idea of marriage. Um, and again, uh, this was reiterated uh, in, by the Supreme Court in a 2018 judgment, um, which was a case that involved a lot of questions around immigration. Um, but here again, Chief Justice Clark made very clear statements um, that there was consistent case law on Article 41, stretching back decades, so going right back to Nicolau, um, uh, which had been reaffirmed that an unmarried family with children or without children um, was not a family unit within the meaning of Article 41. Uh, so again, it's important to remember that that does not mean that family relationships outside of marriage have no constitutional protection or that children in those relationships have no constitutional protection. They do under other provisions of the constitution. And as I said, that might relate to personal rights or the rights of the child. Um, but Article 41, which is the specific provision on the family, uh, is limited. Um, so again, this is a, a very clear statement from the Supreme Court, um, just saying that we have this long history of case law. This is how it is. It stretch, stretches back decades. We've had a lot of change, societal, constitutional, legislative change. Um, but the family that is protected in Article 41 is the family based on marriage. Um, now, again, this was a, a case that involved a lot of immigration questions, and I think it's, it's also important to reflect on the changing nature of Irish society and what can happen, for example, in the context of deportation proceedings. And we have had a case law um, recognising that... Uh, in the context of deportation, a child's best interests must be considered. Um, but one of the very significant judgments, going back to 2003, uh, a case, Lobe and Osayende, um, there you had a split Supreme Court um, that was looking at this language on the family, the inalienable and imprescriptible rights. Uh, the two dissenting judges, uh, Judge Cat Catherine McGuinness and Judge uh, Niall Fennelly, um, they specifically said, um, well, that the child, the children in those cases were Irish citizens and therefore should not be deported, and also pointed to this protection of the family unit. The majority judgment said the family unit was protected in the Constitution, uh, but the protections were not absolute. They were subject to the common good, and the common good uh, was determined uh, by the Supreme Court to be one that required uh, the state being able to deport the family, um, including, in practice, the, the children who were citizen children. So the protections are not absolute. That means we can intervene in the family to provide protection, and we can also, in that context, uh, it was permissible to remove the family from the state. Okay, I'm going to move on now to look 
um, at this specific provision, Article 41.2, Women in the Home. Um, and this is uh, something that was discussed previously by the uh, Convention on the Constitution. It's an unusual provision. It specifically relates to women's life within the home. Um, uh, that women, a woman by her life within the home gives to the state a support without which the common good cannot be achieved. Now, even at the time of putting this provision into the Constitution in 1937, it was highly controversial. Um, many women, as you know, participated in the struggle for independence, were highly involved and active in political life, uh, and objected very strongly to this provision. It was seen as positioning women within the home, but not recognizing all of the other facets of women's lives. Um, it's also very gender specific, and there were objections that it was conflating um, womanhood and motherhood, that all mixed in together, but also that it seemed to be fixing women's lives within the home. Now, a different interpretation of that uh, is one that was given by uh, Justice Denham, as she then was in the Sinnott case. This was a case brought by Jamie Sinnott, a young man um, with severe autism, and his mother, Cathy Sinnott. Uh, they were arguing uh, in relation to the education rights and supports to be given to Jamie beyond the age of 18, but Cathy Sinnott was also arguing that her rights as a carer, a full-time carer, and she was drawing on Article 41.2, should be given more support and recognition by the state. And Justice Denham said that Article 41.2 was about recognizing the significant role played by wives and mothers in the home, and that it didn't exclude uh, women uh, and mothers from other roles and activities. It could be interpreted uh, from a feminist ethic of care perspective, recognizing the traditional role historically that women have played in terms of caring relationships in the home for family members, extended family members, dependent others. Um, but the majority, Justice Denham was in a minority, she was a dissenting judgment, uh, giving a dissenting judgment here. The majority judgment said, uh, and Chief Justice Keane at the time said, uh, that Jamie and Cathy's position invo evoked compassion, but it didn't give rise to legal rights. And there's been a whole series of cases uh, in which uh, women have tried to rely on Article 41.2 uh, to give effect to legal rights in relation to the family home or property, for example, uh, and they have failed. So it has, it, it's, as, it's been interpreted as a, a broad kind of symbolic reference, but not as giving rise to legal rights to support the role of carers and specifically women as carers in the home. So it hasn't been given that kind of recognition in law. It's been widely criticized by uh, UN bodies. Here, the UN Committee on Discrimination Against Women in 2017 criticized Ireland because of the traditional stereotypes that were perpetuated by Article 41.2 and urged the committee to remove this, uh, urged Ireland to remove this stereotypical language. Um, the previous, the Convention on the Constitution in 2013, um, as the chairperson noted earlier, um, voted very overwhelmingly to make this provision gender neutral, to retain a reference uh, to the role of carers, but to make it gender neutral. Um, so that was very significant. Um, but most of the debate, and I participated in, in it at the time, was around whether or not there should be a specific obligation included in the Constitution placed on the state to support the role of carers. Um, so trying to give more teeth, if you like, to um, Article 41.2. Uh, and there were different votes, different percentages here. It's a bit like the outcome of our recent election. Um, but the most number, 35%, voted in favor of putting into the Constitution a requirement that the state provided a reasonable level of support for carers. So imposing a positive obligation on the state to provide support, to allocate resources. And that's what most of the discussion was around at that time. The Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission has produced a policy paper um, saying again, Article 41.2 should be gender neutral. 
um, that family life should be understood as encompassing a wide range of family relationships, including uh, families outside of the home, members outside of the home, and our Article 41.2 should be amended to recognise and support care work. Um, and just to conclude, following on from the previous uh, convention on the Constitution, a task force was set up uh, that looked at three different options. One was replace the text of Article 41.2, um, make it gender neutral, refer to caring for others, but only within the home. So not looking at care roles outside of the home, for example, where somebody may be in a residential institution. Uh, option two was just to keep a very general reference in Article 41.2 and then to put into the directive principles of the Constitution, which are in Article 45, a reference to ensuring support. The significance of that is that Article 45 is not enforceable in the courts. They are called the directive principles. They're not enforceable in the courts, they can be referred to, but they can't give rise to legal rights. So it's, it's quite different uh, from what the Convention on the Constitution had preferred in 2013. And the final option uh, to conclude was simply to delete Article 41.2 in its entirety and to leave that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Mullally. That was um, extremely clear and I think very helpful for our discussions as we uh, get into them later today. Now, as yesterday, I think um, what um, spoke really very clearly to all of us was having heard the general outline of the social situation, the statistical situation, the comparison with other countries, the legal situation, was then to hear from real life people about how all of this um, impacts on their own lives. And I'm delighted that three brave people have volunteered to come this morning and talk to us about their personal experiences. And we're going to hear, um, first of all, from Adele O'Connor, who's going to give us her perspective as a mother. Then we'll hear from Paula Fagan, who is the chief executive of LGBT Ireland. And then from Dave Saunders, who will give his perspective as a father. So I'd like to invite now Adele to come first and speak to us. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to speak here today. I thought long and hard about it all my, as all my life I've fought against labels being put on me. I'm also a very private person, so telling my story makes me feel vulnerable. I'm here to tell you my lived experience. When I was born in 1972, my mother wore a wedding ring even though she was not married. The shame surrounding having a baby out of wedlock in Ireland was huge. She did not want to bring shame onto her family. She didn't want the neighbours finding out. When you look at the definition of illegitimate and words related to it, I can understand why my mother wore a wedding ring. Before I was two years old, my parents got married and I became legitimate, or in other words, legal. As a young girl, I did not dream of growing up and becoming a lone parent. I dreamt of the fairy tale that a lot of young girls dream of, to grow up, have my own home, get married and have children. Fast forward to when I was 21 years old. I had a happy childhood, a great education, and I was working very successfully in the IT sector. I was living with my boyfriend and we were very much in love. When we discovered I was pregnant, we were surprised but delighted. Rather than saving for a wedding, we saved for and bought a house. My daughter was born in October 1994 and it was the happiest day of my life and still my proudest achievement. We decided to give her her father's surname as we knew we would eventually get married. Shortly after she was born, the relationship broke down and we decided to part. I was left with a new baby and a mortgage on my own. I realized then that the fairy tale was over. I became a lone parent family. I tried to make the best of it. My mortgage and my childcare costs were equal. Even though I was in a very well-paid job, I was left with very little disposable income. 
the struggle was daily, as I'm sure it is for many families today. The unexpected came when I had to deal with statutory agencies and assumptions and judgments were made of me. During my daughter's education, parent teacher meetings, etc., I was called Mrs. and my ex's surname. When I corrected them and said Miss, I would get that look. I imagine they would be thinking she's one of those single or married mothers. These stereotypical responses came from different members of society. I would hear statements such as, you made your bed so you can lie in it, or you shouldn't have gotten yourself pregnant. Well, I didn't do it on my own. <laughs> However, I was parenting alone. Even though my daughter had a relationship with her father all through her life and still does, most of the difficult decisions were left to me. When I was travelling outside of the country, I needed a letter for permission from her father to bring my child with me because she had a different surname than me. My story mirrors a lot of stories. I have a voice today for a cohort of society who are voiceless most of the time. A description of the Irish Constitution from the Citizens' Information states that the Constitution establishes the branches or organs of government. It established the courts and it sets out how those institutions should be run. It also describes the fundamental rights of every Irish citizen. Article 41 of the Constitution of Ireland protects the rights of the family and contains several provisions imposing duties on the state. Point one recognises the family as the natural primary and fundamental unit of society. As Professor, Professor Siobhan Mullally said in her presentation, point three point one obliges the state to guard with special care the institution of marriage on which the family is founded. The family is founded on marriage. As you can see from Article 41.3.1, the family is founded on the institution of marriage. Because I chose not to marry, does that make me and my child not a family? I have to disagree and say that my family unit is very strong and I'm disappointed as stated in the definition of the constitution that my family is abnormal or wrong or illegal in some way because we don't fit into the definition of the traditional family as stated. Surely the question should be, what's the fundamental rights of every Irish citizen? My daughter and I have a wonderful relationship. She's 25 now and still living at home with me. Maybe that, that has a lot to do with the economy, but rather than I love for me, but I'll take it. <laughs> Sinead. Good morning. Um, my name is Paula Fagan and I want to talk to you this morning about the issues facing lesbian, gay, bi and transgender families. Speaking firstly in a personal capacity, I've been with my partner Denise for 17 years. I'm already emotional, I don't know why I'm emotional about that, sorry. We have two sons, our eldest son is tur turning 14 and our youngest son is 10 years old. Denise and I planned our family together and we were lucky enough to have our two gorgeous boys who are at the centre of our world. We have the same joys and the same challenges as other families living in Ireland today. Like other families with children our age, one of our biggest challenges is limiting screen time. And I'm, a word to Denise is probably at home doing that at the moment. However, unlike other families, myself and Denise are not both recognised as legal parents of our children. Only one of us is a legal, legally recognised as a parent. As the law stands in Ireland, we have no way for both of us to establish a legal relationship with our children. This presents legal, practical and emotional challenges for us. For example, every time we have to renew one of the boys' passports, one of us must sign a legal affidavit to swear that we are, we are a lone parent. This is despite being civilly partnered to each other, living together for, for 15 years, and raising our boys together since they were born. We have um, legal guardianship of the boys, which means 
for now, both of us can give medical consent in an emergency. However, guardianship runs out when a child turns 18. And for those of you in the room that are parents, you know that um, as a parent, you're a, you're a parent to your child all of their lives. And I suppose we're, with my child now turning 14, we're facing, in four years' time, if the law is not changed, my eldest son will become a stranger to me in the eyes of the law when he turns 18. Sorry, now. <laughs> Our situation is the same for thousands of LGBT-headed families living in Ireland. In my professional role, I work for LGBT Ireland, which is an advocacy organisation working to improve the rights and inclusion of LGBT people and their families. We've been working with the government to bring in legislation that recognises families like ours. And have, as, as the last speaker um, outlined, um, the, the legislation called the Children and Family Relationships Act, which will come into, fully come into force in May 2020, will mean that some same-sex parents will be able to establish parent, a legal parental relationship with their children. This is obviously very welcome. However, this law does not cover all LGBT families, and it will not cover our family, for example. And it highlights the fundamental difficulties for legislators in this area. It is virtually impossible, the way the Constitution is framed, for the legislators, for people in government, to, to bring about law that will recognise diverse family forms and the ever-evolving advances of human reproduction, reproductive technologies. The Constitution needs to recognise, protect and uphold what matters in a family, which is not the gender of the parents or the number of parents, it is the love, commitment, and care within the family that defines it as one. In the case of children being raised by same-sex parents, putting the children at the center of law reform is what matters. Recognizing those who care and protect their, their children every day is in their best interest. As it stands at the moment, the Constitution is a barrier to recognizing our family and thousands of families like us. Marriage equality did not fix this because once there's a donor involved in creating a family, the it, is, it is a problem in terms of the constitution and legislating for that situation. So we ask that you, as representatives of the citizens of Ireland, recognise and protect our family and others like us by broadening the definition of the family. Thank you. Good morning. Delighted to be here. David Saunders is my name, and I'm here to talk about my personal experience as a, as a father, but primarily as a separated father. I was a young dad, and I became a father for the first time at 18 years of age. I then went on to have another child a few years later, and we did. We, we bought a house. We were lucky enough to be able to buy a house at the time and moved in together, and we were a very happy family. The m m relationship started to break down over a number of years, and I ended up moving out of the family home 15 years ago. We, where we were living together for many years. When I moved out, my children were four and 12. I had no idea and I didn't know what to do about my relationship and how it was breaking down and I didn't have the skill sets to talk or open up or share it with anybody. I was devastated when the relationship broke down and I likened it to a grief. <clears throat> it was the death of a relationship and I had no idea how to process it or how to talk about it. I was one of the lucky ones, however, in the fact that I didn't have issues with access to see my children. I never had to go through the court system and I never had to apply for guardianship, so for that I'm forever grateful. When I left the family home, I was lost, terrified, confused, and I was guilt-ridden, and I carried that around with me for a number, of a number of years. I had no choice but to move back to my mother's house due to financial restraints, and I also needed to be around family at this time. I tried to contact local organisations at the time for support and advice because I was lost, confused, and deeply saddened, and I was offered horrible advice. <clears throat> I was, it was made me even worse. I then tried to find out about mediation, and again, the door was, was closed in my face because it was only an option if both parties were willing to engage, and that was not the case for me. 
I had no advice on how to tell my children about the breakup and support them, as they're the most important piece through this process, and to this day I'm forever grateful I have such an incredible relationship, relationship with them. No one can prepare you for how lonely the breakup is and how lost you feel in a house that was once full of toys and children playing and children laughing and crying, and now you're sitting on your own and staring at the four walls with no one to talk to, feeling empty and lost. Will the kids be okay? How is it affecting them and, and their development? Losing some of your friends and your circle also because you were once part of a couple that went down that's no longer part of the piece. To complete another mess you become, no one to advise you or help you about looking after your own mental health through this process. Men tend to listen to other men who've been separated and they're not always the good stories and it paints completely the wrong pictures. The complete and utter madness of trying to parent your children in your mother's house you feel like a failure as it is, and it adds to the mental mess that is already getting to a very dangerous point. And as a man, not being able to hold your hand up in a safe space and just say, I need help, playing the game that everything is okay and fine on the outside, but on the inside, you're crying yourself to sleep at night. I liken it to a beach ball underwater where you just keep pushing and pushing, but eventually it has to come back up. But how can anyone parent in this situation? So, in many sectors, fathers have forgotten part of the family, but they're equally as important as the mother. They have no support and advice and don't even know her rights around guardianship in a lot of cases if you're not married. All painted with the one brush and the terminology deadbeat dads is thrown around when nothing could be further from the truth. No advice or help for fathers who need it the most. The majority of, of men having to move back to the family home and try to rear their children in this environment. Need advice and guidance for fathers on how to support your children and what, what is the best way to support them through the breakup. Fathers want to be good dads and support their children, but we just need help sometimes and we need, we need to know how. I'd like to see a father's network run by, for, by fathers who've been through the process to advise and support other fathers in this, in this system. And clarity around guardianship and automatic guardianship, a proper mediation system to support the family and true mediation reduce the number of families having to go to court. Through a father's network, a link to additional services, i.e. mental health services, children development courses, and maybe additional services that other fathers can avail of and support each other. A programme to help fathers to learn how to co-parent, how to be the best father that you can be with the time that you have with your children, and how your children develop through the varying stages of their growth support fathers and also how to support a mother where possible to explain the importance of this for the children and the family's development and better parental leave and father's rights around in the workplace and housing for separated fathers and community supports and we see through research and personal experience the fathers play a meaningful and complementary role to that of the mothers fathers influence children in meaningful emotional and psychological ways that last a lifetime Let's not forget to empower fathers too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank Linda and Siobhan for sharing their expertise with us, but I want particularly and especially to thank Adele, Paula and Dave for being brave to come up. It's not easy to come up and talk about your personal experience. And I have no doubt that what you've said here this morning will be in everybody's minds as we go through our work and as we think about what you have said and how um, what's written in our constitution has perhaps totally unintended consequences on the lives that you lead. But this assembly is now going to look at that and um, I'm sure you will be as interested as we all will be to see what comes out of it. So I think also that was very powerful and, and very moving testimony. So we're going to end um, the live stream now.